zero knowledge mean math what the heck is a group what is a modular arithmetic what the heck is a set binary operators all of these terms elliptic curve points homomorphism i don't even know where to start you're at the right place my name is kira nightingale and i am a senior smart contract engineer and lead instructor at cipher and updraft and I'm going to take you through some of the mathematical concepts, some of the structures, some of the math things that you need to know in order to understand the foundations of cryptography and zero knowledge proofs. Now, I just want to note before we get started that this is not meant as a standalone conclusive resource for studying these mathematical concepts, but rather a simplified overview to obtain some high level understanding required for you to understand zero knowledge proofs and a little bit about cryptography. For a more detailed mathematical breakdown, I will leave some resources under this video. Some of the mathematical proofs, theorems and definitions have been omitted, but if you are interested in digging further, I encourage you to use your favorite AI assistant and use the linked resources to understand in a little bit more depth how these concepts work from first principles. So for all you mathematicians out there, do not panic. This is meant as a resource for programmers wishing to understand zero knowledge proof. So it's a pared down, simplified breakdown. With that said, let's get on with the video. In this specific video, we are going to be going through set theory, what it is, how it works, and running through some examples. This will hopefully be a bite-sized video. And by the end, you should be comfortable with what a set is. And when you hear the terminology, it should spark an idea in your mind about what it is and how it works. You may not be a pro but at the end of this video, but you'll have some familiarity with the terminology. Let's go through set theory. This is the foundational mathematical language that we need to understand in order to understand zero knowledge proofs and the foundations of cryptography. So what is a set? We don't need to be scared when we hear these terms because they really do not need to be scary. It's just the terminology and language that we have to describe things, usually things that we already use intuitively. So a set is just a collection of distinct elements. And these elements can be anything. So it's just a collection of numbers, letters, objects, etc. So we can say that a set is a collection of distinct elements. And this distinct means each one needs to be different. And we'll define what an element means in a second. So these sets can be anything. What is an element? So we've got an element is a thing that exists in the set. For example, in the infinite set of integers, you have number one. Number one is an element in that set. So it's just a thing in the set. And it's just the word that we use to say something in the set because it doesn't necessarily need to be a number because it could be numbers, it could be letters, it could be shapes, objects, and the list continues. And now we denote sets using the curly bracket notation. So anything inside these curly brackets is in the set. So for instance, we could have the set of integers 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then we say these are the elements in the set. So we've got the first element in the set is 0, the second element of this in the set is 1, and so on. And we have five distinct elements in the set. So 1, Oops, two, three, four, five. And so the number of elements in the set is known as the cardinality. The cardinality is a measure of the relative size of a set. So we've got three things that have been introduced here. We've got a set, which is a collection of distinct elements. We denote it with curly braces. And each thing in the set needs to be unique, needs to be distinct, different from each other. And they're all called elements. And then the number of elements in the set is known as the cardinality. Let's go through the different types of sets. We have two main types of sets, finite and infinite sets. And then there are two types of infinite set, countably infinite sets and uncountably infinite sets. Let's write all those down. I'm gonna use three colors to make this clear. So first of all, we have countably infinite sets, and then we have uncountably infinite sets draw a little line down the middle. So first, countably infinite sets. Countably infinite sets have the same cardinality as the set of natural numbers. In other words, you can list the elements in the set in a sequence where each element is paired up with a unique natural number. 
Now, this may sound confusing that countably infinite sets or infinite sets in general can have a cardinality. And basically, this just means that different infinities have different sizes. And we'll explain more about that in a second. But just because we can't have an explicit number to denote the cardinality, we do actually still have a cardinality to describe the size of the infinity. And so the set of natural numbers n actually is itself a countably infinite set. And that is 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And also we can optionally remove 0, so we could have 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. These are all the natural numbers. And then we also have the integers, which we denote with z. So this is natural numbers and then this is integers. So we can have 0, 1, minus 1, 2, minus 2, 3, minus 3, and so forth. There is a natural order. So you can see here with the integers, the integers can be listed in a sequence such as this. Then we also have the positive integers, which we denote with z plus. These are the positive integers, which are 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. And they are also countably infinite set. And then we have the rational numbers, which we denote with Q. And these are numbers that can be expressed as a quotient or fraction of two integers, where the numerator and the denominator are both non-zero integers. In other words, a rational number is any number that can be written in the form A over B, where both A and B are integers. Integers are examples of rational numbers, but for instance, we can just have B equals to one for all integers. And rational numbers are another example of a countably infinite set. And rational numbers don't include irrational numbers, obviously, such as the square root of 2, pi, e, etc. Because they cannot be expressed as a fraction of two integers. Don't worry too much if you don't understand what all of these things mean. It doesn't really matter in the context of zero knowledge proofs. All you really need to understand is that countably infinite sets is in a set in which each element can be put in order. It can be placed in one to one correspondence with natural numbers. Again, this also sounds confusing. So this is actually easier to understand if we look at what uncountably infinite sets are. And I think it's easier to understand what countably infinite sets are if you can see an example of where this is not true. Uncountably infinite sets are ones which cannot be placed in one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers, meaning that there are more elements in the set than there are natural numbers. For example, let's take the set of real numbers between any two distinct real numbers, say between naught and one. There are infinitely many real numbers in this interval and they cannot be listed in a sequence. So between 0 and 1, we have 0.01. We have 0.001. We have 0.001. We also have 0.1, 0.11, 0.111, 0.1111, and so forth. We have 0.2, 0.02, 0.22, etc. There are infinitely many real numbers between any two distinct real numbers, and they cannot be listed in a sequence. And the cardinality of an uncountably infinite set is larger than the cardinality of a countably infinite set. The infinity is larger. So examples include, as we said, the real numbers, which is denoted with R, and these are the set of real numbers between any two distinct real numbers is uncountably infinite. There are infinitely many real numbers in this interval and they cannot be listed in a sequence. Also, C, the complex numbers, these are uncountably infinite because it includes all possible combinations of real and imaginary parts. Do not worry if you do not understand complex numbers, it doesn't really matter, it's just an example of uncountably infinite sets. So these are all examples of infinite sets, but what about finite sets? So a finite set is a set with a countable number of elements. There are a limited number of elements. For a finite set, the cardinality is a unique natural number. Examples of finite sets include primary colours. So what do we have? Red, yellow, blue, hours in a day, days of the week. And then most importantly, because this is the example that we are going to be using when we are understanding zero knowledge proofs and cryptography, is the set of remainders of integers modulo n, where n is an integer. For example, if we have n equals 5, the set of remainders of integers modulo 5 would be 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, you'll note here the cardinality of this set is 5. 
So for the set of remainders of integers modulo n, which we're just going to say integers modulo n, the cardinality is always equal to n. And the largest number in the set is always equal to n minus 1. Now, how do we get this set? How come it doesn't go up to 5? Let's do some examples. It's like a number line. So you have 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 on this number line. And any integer that we can take from the set of integers can be mapped to one of these four when we take the remainder when we do divide by five. So what does modulo mean? That's the first thing we need to define. So modulo is when we do some number a divided by the number that we're taking the modulo n and then take the remainder r. So the way we note this is we do, let's say we have a number seven and we're taking five to be the number that we're doing modulo. So we do percent five. So that would be equal to seven divided by five, which is one. And then how many do we have left over? We have two. And the other way we can note this is we do seven mod five equals two. So let's say we did some calculation. Let's say we did seven plus three. And then when we are doing this in modulo, we would then take mod five. So seven, eight, nine, 10 mod five is zero. And so it would be mapped to number zero. Let's say we had a calculation that was equal to five. Five divided by five goes equally one with no remainder. So then we go back to the beginning of the number line. So we can just repeat each time. Let's say we go to six. If we have six divided by five is one with one remainder. So it gets mapped over to number one. Let's say we had 12. 12 divided by five is two with two remainder. So it'd be mapped to two. And you can see by taking the remainder, we are only ever going to be in these realm of numbers. Therefore, this is the set. Now, this may seem a little bit confusing and don't worry because this is just a primer for integers modulo n. And so the next video is going to be all about modular arithmetic. So don't worry if you didn't understand that. That was just a brief little primer. What have we learned? We've learned what a set is. A set is just a collection of distinct elements. These elements can be really anything. And we have three types of set. We have the infinite set, in which we have two types of infinite set, countably infinite sets, which can be placed in one-to-one -one correspondence with natural numbers. You can list the elements in the set in a sequence, which each element is paired with a natural number. We also have uncountably infinite sets, which cannot be placed in one-to-one -one correspondence with natural numbers. So there are more elements in the set than there are natural numbers. And the classic example is a set of real numbers between any two distinct real numbers, for example, zero and one, there are infinitely many real numbers in this interval. They cannot be listed in a sequence. And finally, we had finite sets with a countable number of elements. And we had examples of that, such as days of the week, hours in the day. And then finally, we had the set of remainders of integers modulo n, which is going to be the key to understanding a lot of ZK proofs.